weekend, we just want to welcome everybody here who said we're coming because we want to worship God today. So welcome as always. Uh, we've started a new series called The Wonder of It All. And if you haven't got into what we're going to be talking about today by that song, we're going to be talking about Let's Go Fishing. Maybe you saw it on in the sign. I was hoping we'd see a bunch of people with their boats and stuff coming and wonder what we're doing. Maybe we're going to take an excursion. But we're not. But we're going to talk about fishing today. And you can either look in, we're going to be in Luke 5, verses 1 through 11, also Mark chapter 1, 14 through 20. Our big question today is that we know that the best fishermen often have some expensive rods and reels and lures, but they're only tools. And if those tools don't help them catch fish, they become worthless. Just a quick story about that is talking to a friend of Bob Pools that they fish a lot together, and they have a system that's pretty cool. But Bob gave him as a present for his birthday a fishing lure, a pencil plug if I'm not mistaken. And what he did on it, because they were kind of in competition, who's going to catch the most fish in a boat? He said, here's the lure for you. Well, he cut the barbs off it and kind of straightened the hook. <laughs> so he said, here you go, just because of competition. But the question again is, what tools do we use to catch souls for Jesus? And how does Jesus turn us into fishers of men? There's a story of a man who was out in the river, had a brand new boat, all the best fishing equipment that money could buy, and a man pulls up alongside his boat and admires his boat and all his new equipment, all this stuff, and he asked the man, how are you doing today? And the man said, well, I just got out here today, but yesterday, you should have seen me. I caught almost 30 walleye just yesterday. And the man was taken back, and he looked at him and said, do you know who I am? He said, how do I know who you are? He said, I am the county game warden. <laughs> and the man looked at the game warden and says, do you know who I am? He said, no, I don't. He says, I'm the biggest liar in St. Clair County. <laughs> 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 Living in this area, we know fishing is huge. I mean, we have a pickerel tournament just for these things. And so we have the river, we got the lake, we got the bay. There are so many places that we can fish. And the thing is, you can do it year long if you want. They're a little upset this year because they can't get into some ice fishing. But you've been out there some days and you know that ice isn't very thick and there's people out there wanting to ice fish. And the question is, how many of you like to, to fish? I know there's some people who just like to go fishing. And fishing can be a very, very fun and relaxing pastime. But there are a lot of people who carry this pastime to a whole higher level. I've known some people in this community that spent several thousands of dollars on rods and reels. I even looked up in the internet and I saw that it's amazing how much you could spend on just a rod or a reel. And if you really want to get into it, what about the boat? We can go very cheap, we can go pretty expensive, or we can go, holy cow, <laughs> let's go catch some fish. There's even professional fishermen who do this for a living, and they compete against each other for prizes that sometimes exceed over a million dollars. And for the most part, they don't even keep the fish. It's a catch and release kind of a thing. But back in the day of Peter and James and John, these guys were not sport fishermen. They didn't catch and release. They caught a fish for a living. This wasn't a pastime. This was their livelihood. And here they'd been fishing all day and didn't catch a thing. They were tired, they were frustrated, and they just wanted to put their nets up for the day and just call it a day. There was no use going on fishing anymore. The day was too hot. The fish would seek deeper water. It was just a useless time. So Peter and John now beached their boats, and they began to wash their nets, fix their nets, do what they had to do. It was tedious work, but this is what they're doing. Then all of a sudden, Jesus shows up. Jesus was preaching. 
it was popular at this time that crowds were now gathering around wherever he went. And he wanted to hear him preach. And then he saw, Jesus saw these boats here at the edge of the water. And he gets into one of the boats, one of Peter's boats, and asks him to take you, can you just take me out a little ways so I can preach to these people? Now you think about this, it's a little presumptuous of this man just walking and seeing these guys working, trying to get their boats there done for the day, and just walking, hey, I need your boat, can you take me out for a little bit so I can preach to these people? Now, Jesus does it. Peter listens. And it must have been Peter had to know him a little bit. You just don't come up to a stranger. And Jesus really wasn't a stranger. As we read in 1 John, it says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said. We're talking about John the Baptist and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You'll be called Cephas, which now will be translated into Peter. So he's it's kind of interesting. I like that. Introduces himself. He said, I'm going to call you Peter. That's not my name, but I'm going to call you Peter. Oh, okay. I'm good with that. <laughs> so we know that before this happened, Peter knew Jesus. They had been personally introduced from the day Peter probably first met Jesus he probably developed a liking for him. You know he saw something different. Because crowds are already following him. There was something special about this Jesus. Probably couldn't put his thumb on it, but he knew. He just knew he liked listening to him. He knew there was something about him. And I bet even every now and then, because they're in that same area, Peter might have got done fishing, or he might have slipped away and gone and listened to Jesus speak. It was probably a nice little diversion of what was going on in his day and sometimes probably even felt better after listening to Jesus. You might even say that Peter became one of uh, maybe a, this group of followers of Jesus that kind of just like listened to him. But that's pretty much all Peter had been up to this point. Just kind of uh, in the crowd listening to him. Kind of what we call maybe just a pew sitter and just, I just want to listen to this man. He probably sang some songs if Jesus led some songs. He probably prayed when Jesus prayed. He probably quietly listened to the sermon and then he'd go home. Jesus to him was probably a real pleasant diversion. But Jesus was not the focus of Peter's life. The focus of Peter's life at this time was fishing. It was the way he made a living. But now here's this Jesus. He's preaching again. He seems to need Peter's help. So Peter thinks, well, sure, I like the guy. I can help him out. So Peter throws his net in a the boat. They pull off ashore. And for the next hour or so, Peter gets a front row seat of listening to Jesus preach. He's probably enthralled by him. I mean, I got the best seat in the house, and I get to hear him preach. And then the sermon was over. And as the crowd starts to disperse, Peter's ready to bring the boat into shore. But Jesus wasn't ready for that. And when Jesus was done speaking, he turns to Simon and says, go a little out deeper. Go into the deeper water and let your nets down for a catch. Well, you can see Peter being a little confused here. I mean, he was a professional fisherman. And Peter knew two things. This is the wrong time of day to catch fish, and this is the wrong part of the lake to do any kind of fishing. And you could hear him almost thinking, I just got done cleaning my nets. If I throw them in that water again, I'll have to take them back out, go back to shore, clean them all over again. I like this guy, Jesus. I love what he says, but he's not a fisherman. What does he really know? You can almost hear the frustration in his voice when he says, Master, <laughs> we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. And you can see him kind of looking hopefully at Jesus. Just say, let's forget this. Let's just go back in. But really, Peter, he's hoping Jesus would say, yeah, all right, Peter, you, you know this better than I do. Don't worry about it. 
But Jesus doesn't say anything. He just looks at Peter with that look. I can see the look. And says, I told you go out in deeper water. And just put your nets into the water. Let's, let's do this. And Peter sighs and says, Okay, because you say so, I'll do it. I'll do it. And then suddenly, as soon as he puts those nets into the water, the water starts to bubble up. And as Peter draws the nets closer, fish are being brought up in such a large mass amount that he has to call another boat over to help him. In fact, they caught such a large number of fish, their nets begin to break. The nets were so heavy that Peter had to call for help. This had never happened to him before. They'd caught their share of fish in their day, but this kind of fish was unheard of. They had big catches, but nothing even close to this. And the other thing was, they caught all this fish at a time of day when you don't even think about going fishing. They caught all these fish in an area that they never caught fish like this before. And Peter suddenly realizes, wait a minute, this guy's just not some ordinary preacher. He's heard people talk to Jesus and call him, you are the son of God. And he never really thought much about it, but all of a sudden he goes, wow. And he starts believing this. And it scares him. And when Simon Peter saw that the nets were filled, he fell down at Jesus' feet. And he says, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. And I like what Jesus said to him. He tells him, don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to catch men. And Peter and James and John left their boats and followed him full time. I want you to think about this too. These men, their whole lives, were fishermen. That was their livelihood. And on the day of their biggest catch of anybody, thing that people are going to talk about for months, that did you see how much fish is on the day of their biggest catch, they walked away from it and followed Jesus. Now, what did I learn from this? What light snapped on for me as I was studying this? I learned something truly earth-shattering as I studied this passage here, this revelation that kind of started to influence my thinking. And here's the revelation, and I want to know if you think the same way I do, because I'm going to tell you anyways. <laughs> and the question is, what is the primary objective of a fisherman? I want you to think about that question. It's a hard one. It's to catch fish. In case you were wondering, you don't have to look this up. Trust me on this one. The average, or the avid fisherman can spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on boats and lures and all the best stuff. He can have the best boat on the lake, the best boat in the river. But if his equipment, and he can even have sonar, heat-seeking fish missiles, he can have everything he needs. If it doesn't catch fish, he lost a lot of money and put a lot of money for nothing. The rods, the reels, the lures, the bait, the boat, they're just tools. Now, here's the deal. What is our primary objective as a church? Our primary objective is to win souls for Jesus Christ. That's our primary objective. Now, over the past few years, we've done a lot here. We put on a new roof. We painted, and it looks nice out there. We've redone the fellowship hall downstairs. We've redone the kitchen. Go down to the high school classrooms. We've did all this work here. But we must remember, the building is only a tool. Our objective is not just to build and make this look good. Our objective is to use this building as a tool to win souls to Jesus Christ. If our building doesn't help us accomplish that goal, then it's become worthless to us. We have great Sunday school and Wednesday nights for the kids and for the adults, but those are just tools. 
our objective as a church is not just to do Sunday school or just do church or just do Wednesday night. Our objective is to use those different programs to help us to learn more about Jesus Christ so we can be prepared to teach others who have questions about our faith and want to follow Jesus Christ. We have an excellent music. You do so much, what a wonderful job. The women come up and do such a great job. But the music we have is just a tool. Our objective as a church is not just to be a bunch of great singers. Our objective is to be so involved in singing praises to Jesus that it creates an excitement inside us. And that excitement bleeds over as we leave here and cause people to go, what are you so happy about? Why do you have this song in your heart? And I can go on and on of the many different things that we do here. The preaching, the meditation, the communion, the offering, the youth program, the quilters, the knitters, all these special events that we do. We don't exist to do these things. We exist to bring people to Jesus Christ. And those activities are all tools to help us to do that. Jesus said, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. And we've been given a great privilege as a family of believers. The privilege of being able to fish with Jesus. The privilege of making a difference for him, because of him. Jesus wants us to go fishing with him. And the question is, how do we do it? Kind of seems like if we look at the Bible, it's just a nice gradual process. First, Jesus usually starts with people who want to be with him. As Peter. Tell me if you're going to go fishing. Now, I know Bob goes fishing. I know some of you people go fishing. You usually want to go fishing with friends, people you like. doesn't make sense. I'm just going to go. I'm going to find a guy I hate the most that hates fishing. I'm just going to put him in a small little boat with me, and we're going to be out there for a few hours. doesn't make sense. Usually when you go fishing, you want to be with somebody you like being with. Fishing in a small boat is a real bad place to be with people who just don't want to be there. Now, Peter liked Jesus. He liked being around Jesus. He liked listening to Jesus. And that's why when Jesus got into his boat and asked Peter to take him out from shore just a little bit, Peter wasn't offended. It was okay. It's a small favor he felt for somebody I respect. Now, here we are. You're here at church today. I hope it's because you love Jesus. You like being around him. You like learning about him. You love hearing stories about him. You are the people that Jesus looks at to become fishers of men. Because you like him. No, you love him. You're here today when everybody else says, I don't know if you should be in church. You people came because you love Jesus Christ. You're here today because you want to learn more about Jesus Christ. And frankly, you're the people that Jesus says, I want to make you fishers of men. Because he starts with people who like being around him. And then he gives us an opportunity to serve him. Peter was just washing his nets to get them ready for the next day. And Jesus looks at him and says, you wouldn't mind helping me, would you? All Peter had to do was row his boat off just a little ways off into the water, drop an anchor, and sit and listen to Jesus talk. It wasn't a huge job, but somebody had to do it. And like I said, it was a small favor to do for somebody he respected and loved. That's the beauty of this church. There's so many little things that we can do here. So many little things that if you haven't gotten involved, that I just want to get my feet wet a little bit. There's so many little things we can do, from being a greeter to helping with communion, helping out with our youth group, our junior church, our Sunday school, our youth groups. We got a van out here. You say, I can drive. I'd like to drive and pick people. We got a van out there. If you see things that you might, hey, you know what would be cool? Come talk to me. Let's get this ball rolling. You don't have to have any particular skills to do some of these things. You don't have to have a PhD. You don't have to come to office and say, all right, we're going to go through a seven-week program on how to be a proper greeter. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. 
you just have to think to yourself, what can I do for Jesus Christ? And then Jesus doesn't stop there. This is what I like about this, this story. Once he knows you love him enough to do the small things for him and get your feet wet a little bit, he says, I'm going to take you in a little deeper water. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to really, really trust me. And notice what Peter, Jesus said to him, put out into deep water and let your nets down. When Peter, what was Peter supposed to do? All he had to do was put his net down. Just put your nets down. That wasn't a very difficult task, but it didn't make any sense to him because Peter's going, this shouldn't work. There shouldn't be any fish in that water. He's got me at the wrong time of the day. Peter may even have been concerned that his friends on shore are looking at him going, what is that man doing? <coughs> Ooh, whoa. Excuse me. <laughs> it would almost be embarrassing to him, he's thinking, to come back and have to explain to his friends, yeah, um, I don't know what we're doing. I said, I can see him, were you really putting your nets out in a place that you know there's no fish? In the heat of the day, and if he came back with nothing there, he said, I, I, have you lost it? And he said, where did you get that idea? Well, this guy here, he's not even a fisherman. Why would you listen to him? But it did work. And in the same way, Jesus may be asking you to go out in a little deeper water. Go a little deeper in your faith. To put down your nets. Maybe start talking to people about Jesus Christ. It's not that hard. All you have to do is tell someone what Jesus Christ means to you. All you have to do is say, man, how my life has changed. I want you to also notice that the people that this man went to to become fishers of men wasn't in the synagogue. It wasn't the learned. He went to hard-working, hard-nosed. Here you are. You're the ones that are going to be able to explain who I am because of the change in you, and people are going to see that change in you. But somewhere deep inside, we're going to be tempted just like Peter was probably thinking before he put those nets down, I don't know if this is going to work. Why would anybody even listen to me if I say anything about Jesus? Do I really have anything to say? What do you do if they ask me a question? Am I going to be able to answer that question? And when you've been tempted to listen to that little voice, you need to remember something. When Peter let those nets down, it was filled with fish. And they got filled with fish, not because the skill he had as a fisherman. It wasn't years of training he had as a fisherman and the expertise that he had as a fisherman. All he did is put the nets in the water. And Jesus Christ filled the nets. All he had to do was obey. That was it. You see, Jesus isn't as concerned about how many souls you catch as he is with that you just simply lower your net into the water and share your faith. Jesus isn't looking for a huge catch. He's looking for huge obedience. There's a story of an older man walking down the beach and it was just after a, a big storm and the storm was going. As he walked down the beach, there was tens of thousands of starfish all over the shore. He was looking and he looked in the head him a little bit and he saw a young boy taking him one by one and throwing him in the ocean. And the old man stopped the boy and said, What are you doing? He said, Well, if I don't do this, these starfish are going to die. I gotta get them back into the water. And the old man looked at the boy and said, Are you kidding me? There is no way you can save all these starfish. And he grabbed one, the little boy, and as he threw it in the water, he said, it makes a difference to that one. It makes a difference to that one. It may be that you only catch one person for Jesus, but to that one person, you just made a difference because you just gave him eternity. We even look at Andrew. Really, the only thing we ever really heard about Andrew is that he introduced Peter to Jesus. 
And look what that led to. If you're reading the book of Acts, really Ananias. He's the one that talked Saul. And really that's all we know about it. You look what Saul became Paul and look what that man did. One person changed. Because you can make a difference. One person. I want to close with this. I want you to think about this. I want you to think about the disciples, the apostles. These men, they lived with Jesus for over three years. They saw Jesus teach. They saw him perform all kinds of miracles. They saw him like no one else saw him. They laughed with him. They cried with him. They saw him. They saw the Son of God in person and in flesh. But they also saw him beaten and whipped. They saw him nailed to a cross. They saw the man die. They saw him get buried. They saw these things. But then the greatest ending to the greatest story ever took place. The resurrection. And they saw that. And I can see in their minds was, what's the sequel to this? We watched him get beat, we watched him die, and now he rose again. What's next? And it's probably only one thing that these boys were thinking. And they asked him, are you going to finally kick Rome out of here? Are we going to be large and in charge? Is Israel not going to be the envy of all nations again? Jesus had spent three years trying to impress on them the idea that the kingdom of God was not a political thing. But they still didn't understand. So Jesus tells them, if you'd, it would be best if you just hang around here in Jerusalem just for a few days. After I'm gone, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and he's going to explain the stuff to you. And maybe he said, maybe he'll, the Holy Spirit, have a lot better luck with you people than what I'm having right now. Now, I know that's not scriptural. I just made that up, but I can see Jesus. <laughs> see, okay, you're not getting what I'm going to say. The Holy Spirit's going to explain it all to you. They wanted to know what was coming next. What is next? So Jesus gets really explicit with them, and he says, no one knows for sure when God is going to bring all this grand to a grand finale. I'm coming back. But, but in the meantime, listen to me, boys, but in the meantime, you must go around and be witnesses just telling people what you saw and what you experienced. In other words, Jesus is looking at these boys and he says, Tag, you're it. You're the sequel. Now go. And it probably wasn't what they expected. They may assume that they would get to continue just to sit in the front row. This is really cool now. Jesus is really going to take off now. And we just get to sit back and watch him just throw Rome out. Watch him establish his kingdom here. And this is going to be so cool. But Jesus didn't tell him that. He's telling him, no more sitting on the front row watching. Get out there. Get out there into the game. And do what you've seen me do. And again, in other words, he's saying, Tag, you're it. And he must have wondered, Are you joking? Seriously? Us? I mean, we got to watch you for three over three years, but you also got to watch us for those three years. And you know we're all messed up. We're basically, some of us could be declared dysfunctional, maybe. And we're going to need some help. And I like what Jesus did. Even with that question on their face going, us? Us? He leaves. <laughs> he leaves. And I love, these, <laughs> I love this story. Because I can see the disciples as Jesus floats up and disappears. They're all staring at the clouds. And I can hear them. Oh, he'll be back in a minute. He's just going to check in. <laughs> Tell him everything's fine. He's coming back. I can see him looking. He's, he's a funny dude, isn't he? He's just messing with our minds right now. There's no way. As they looked at each other. I can see Peter. Hey, no way. He's leaving you guys in charge. Are you seriously? He's coming back right now. It got to the point where two angels had to come down and say, what are you boys staring at? 
You heard what he said. Now go out there. Go out there and do what he tells us to do. Why in the world would Jesus have left these things like this? Why them? Why would Luke write a book of Acts telling us about the adventures after Jesus left? Why would God see fit to preserve a book so we can read the book of Acts? Here's why. Because God, who is far wiser than any of us, his plan to rescue the world is through the church. We're the plan. We're the sequel. We're the ones asked to do this. This is God's plan. Not some corporation. Not some big university. Not a nation. Not some economic strategy. It's the followers he left behind. And now it is us. The church. A group of believers. He still comes to this church, his church, and he still says, you will be my witnesses. And your main assignment is to come to know me and to love me and become fishers of men and help others to do the same. That's the plan. It's that simple. I don't know if anybody has any questions about that. The earliest followers bet the farm on this. Everything they had, they betted on what Jesus said to them. We're putting all our marbles in one basket because Jesus told us to go out into the world and preach the gospel, baptize him in the name of the Father and the Son. He told us to do this stuff. Not, hey, go back fishing. Hey, go back, don't worry about it. He gave them an assignment as he gives us an assignment just as well. And those boys put everything they had into this plan. To the point that they endured persecution, to the point where they endured humiliation, and to the point that they died for it. Why would they do such a thing? Because they remembered their lives before Jesus Christ, and it didn't mean anything. And one day, Jesus showed up and told them, I want to give you a bigger purpose. I want to give you a bigger mission than just out there catching fish. I want you to partner with God in the greatest mission ever conceived. He tells each and every one of us, I have a purpose for you. I have a mission for you. It's not just a restoration of Israel, as as these boys thought. It is a redemption of the entire world and the human race, one person at a time. And then they said, what do we have to do? What do we have to do? And Jesus says, go and be my witnesses. They had no strategic plan. They had no resources. They had no building. They had no staff. But they found out that if you just talk to people about Jesus Christ openly, honestly, in a language that they can understand, things begin to happen when you plant those seeds. They found out if you do the kinds of things Jesus did, and this is important, do the things that Jesus did. As you read about the life of Jesus Christ, he didn't get anybody in a headlock. He didn't make anybody feel bad. People were drawn to this man for a reason. Because they, he showed love. He showed understanding. It wasn't... It was, we need to talk. How can I help you? That's what Jesus Christ did. That's the example. That's what the church is called to be and to do in every generation. To talk about Jesus. We got the little cards back there that we just can invite people. But we need to bet the farm on his plan. We need to do what he asks us to do. Do what he asked Peter to do. Just let your nets down and trust me. He wants us to fish with him. We need to let him empower us to be his ambassador. We need to love and obey him. 
and stake everything we have on Jesus without any reservation, without any condition. Well, I can do this if. There's no if. There's no but. We need to let him empower us to live life during this little brief time that we're on this earth in the light that he's coming back. And to treasure, this is a unique time of opportunity that we have now. That we get one day at a time. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but Jesus, I'm giving you an opportunity today. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to be so caught up in your everyday plan? Or are you going to see the bigger picture? Are you going to take that opportunity and run with it? For it is only on this earth that I can share the gospel and serve people in need and love people and help people because you know that's what matters most to God because you know as Jesus tells us, as he told his apostles, as he told everybody, as he looks at it with that, with that glitter in his eye, the smile on his face, and he's smiling at you right now and he's saying, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our dear precious Heavenly Father, we just come to you today just thanking you for who you are. We thank you so much of the love that you have for us. We thank you so much that you have this bigger picture. Let us be part of that. Let us see that you want us part of the plan. That we are part of the sequel. That you left the job up to us to tell people about you. That you are coming back. Give us the strength and the courage and the wisdom to do these things. Give us your eyes, dear Heavenly Father. Let no one go unnoticed. Let us see people as you see them. Not in our way, but as potential to help with the kingdom. Let us walk this earth now as Christ did. Looking to help. Looking to love. Looking to forgive. As we go through so many things, it's so hard with so many things that are on this earth that the devil is trying to pull us away. Dear Heavenly Father, get him out of our way. Give us that strength to do so. Let us get up every morning and help us put that shield on, the armor of you, as we go and proclaim the wonderful promises that you give us. Be with us as we leave here today always with their eyes open, always seeing opportunities, dear Heavenly Father, but always with a smile on our face and that twinkle in our eye because we know the promise that you have given us and we're taking that to the bank. And thank you for that. And it's your name that we pray. Amen.